Good morning uh, from Paris and welcome to this webinar on resilient cities. Um, I would first give a little bit of context for today's discussion. Um, there is, as we all know, of course, a widespread consensus on the importance of strengthening resilience in cities. The UN Agenda for Sustainable Development, in particular SDG 11, the new urban agenda, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change have all identified resilience as a pathway towards sustainable and inclusive development in cities and communities. This is now on top of the agenda. We are all navigating multiple interconnected crises at the same time, and cities around us are facing the impact of climate change, the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, and the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Climate change causes shocks, floods, droughts, heat waves, and stresses on water shortages and environmental degradation. The war in Ukraine, of course, beyond the humanitarian emergency in Ukraine, forced millions of people to flee their homes and seek new homes in other cities around Europe. The COVID-19 pandemic affects cities and communities, both as a global health shock, but also at a socioeconomic level. Uh, if you do not act now, these interrelated crises will deepen existing challenges. Yet, as we all know, challenges can be turned into opportunities. We can strengthen resilience, we can address long-standing vulnerabilities in cities by transforming the urban living environment, the society, the economy, and its institution. And we have seen many European cities leading the way. At the same time, cities cannot do it alone. They need finance, capacity building, and knowledge sharing to build the ability to cope, adapt, and thrive in face of these shocks and stresses. And helping cities to become more resilient is at the heart of the Council of Europe Development Bank, CEB's mandate as Europe's social development bank. Now, zooming in on, on finance and capacity building. Uh, from CEB's side, we offer a range of flexible financing instruments that enable cities to strengthen resilience to crises. For instance, financing for cities to improve public transport, increase access to green and public spaces, and scaling up resilience, social and affordable housing. We also work with financial institutions to provide financing, uh, to address financing gaps of small cities and towns. And alongside the financial instruments, we also provide technical support and advisory services to cities. But in combination with funding, cities also need access to learning from peers and knowledge. Cooperation between cities and organizations like CB, OECD, and the global city networks such as ICLEI is crucial. The CB has recently published a technical brief to foster dialogue among cities practitioners in European countries on how to strengthen resilience in a way that ensures that the most vulnerable are not left behind. The study reflects the rich experience of European cities and was prepared in co collaboration between CEB, OECD, and ICLE, among other organizations. Since 2019, the CEB has supported the World Observatory on Subnational Government Finance and Investment, a multi stakeholder initiative led by OECD and the United States and local governments. The World Observatory is the most comprehensive source of standardized, robust, and transparent data on subnational governance, finance, and investment. As a global city network, ICLE leads knowledge sharing and drives local action for resilient development in cities. Building on the successful collaboration for the technical brief, we look forward to strengthening our partnership with ICLE. Uh, today's webinar will be an opportunity to discuss key lessons and hear the experience of leading cities that are here today. And I would like to thank all of the leading cities for joining us that have successfully implemented resilience strengthening initiatives. With these introductory remarks, let me now introduce Elisa Muzzini from CEB, who will present some of the key lessons from European cities that has put resilience into action. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so um, the purpose of our webinar today is to Shared lessons learned on how to strengthen city resilience in a way that's um, inclusive, that is equitable, and that provides opportunities for all. So we are going to hear from cities that have moved to action to strengthen resilience. 
And we hope that sharing their experiences will inspire other cities to move to action. Um, to frame the discussion, I'm going to present briefly some of the findings of our uh, technical brief. So we adopted a broad perspective on resilience, which we define as the capacity of a city and its communities to cope, to adapt, and to transform in order to thrive in a world that is confronted with multiple and overlapping crises. So we ask ourselves the question, how can cities strengthen resilience and aim to leave no one behind? Because we know that some groups and communities are more vulnerable to crises because of where they live, their economic status, or individual characteristics, which may be related to factors such as, such as age or gender among others. Um, so in uh, our technical brief, we identified seven enabling city actions that are key to strengthen resilience and leave no one behind. In our webinar, we're going to focus on two of these uh, seven enabling city actions, establishing an inclusive participatory planning process and developing sustainable financing solutions. What's important to note is that these seven actions are interlinked and they're part of an iterative process. So what matters at the end is coordinated actions across all the seven areas. So in the first round table, we are going to discuss the importance of, importance of inclusive participation to strengthen resilience. So what we found in our technical brief is that European cities are experimenting with innovative and flexible approaches to ensure that the voices of all groups are heard. So how are they doing that? Well, first of all, by adopting a vulnerability lens to tailor the approach to the reality on the ground, because there is no one size fits all approach for inclusive participation. But it's also about mainstreaming participation in the planning process, for instance, by adopting neighborhood action plans. And we've seen that um, cities are also moving beyond participation by empowering communities to come up with their own solutions to meet local needs. So in our first round table, we're going to hear about four programs that have put communities at the center of resilience buildings. These are programs led by the cities of Barcelona, Kuopio, Rotterdam, and Dublin. In the second round table, we're going to discuss how to develop sustainable financing solutions to strengthen resilience. So the purpose is really to deliver impact at scale with a focus on the vulnerable groups. And this requires an approach to financing, which is integrated and multi-pronged. So it is first of all about strengthening the city financial capacity to support the diversification of financial resources and their optimal use. So it's about the capacity of a city to borrow, to raise taxes. But it's not just about that. It's also about integrating resilience into investment plans, which are aligned with city strategies as a way to mobilize finance at scale. And last but not least, it's about linking financing solutions to inclusive governance models, such as participatory budgeting, um, to um, enhance the, the local benefits of resilience. So in our second round table, we're going to hear from uh, the city of Tbilisi, Cascais, and Genoa about their experience on developing sustainable financing solutions. Unfortunately, um, the deputy mayor, Cristina Dongeta Saaccio, um, cannot join us because she had a medical urgency. Um, to end, I'd like to say that we hope that um, this uh, roundtable discussion will also provide an opportunity to highlight the linkages between the two actions, because most of the speakers will talk about both actions. And this is to show what's possible when inclusive participation meets sustainable financing in terms of enhancing the local benefits, uh, reaping the co-benefit of resilience, and scaling up initiatives that have been tested successfully at the community level. So it's now time to move to our first roundtable discussion. And it's um, um, with great pleasure that 
going to introduce Nua Etienai. She is a Senior Urban um, Resilience and Climate Adaptation Officer at ICLE, and she is going to moderate um, our first roundtable discussion. So Nua, over to you, the floor is yours. Hello, and thank you. thanks a lot, Elisa, for the kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Noha Eltine. I am from ICLE, and I work as a Senior Urban Resilience and Climate Adaptation Officer. And uh, just a quick introduction, who is ICLE? ICLE stands for the, uh, the Local Governments for Sustainability, and we are a global network for more than 2,500 local and regional governments who we work together towards supporting uh, uh, the development and the implementation of the European Green Deal, as well as supporting cities in achieving their climate neutrality and building more resilient and equitable communities. I'm honored to be uh, co-moderating uh, the session today with my colleagues uh, Elisa from uh, the Council of Europe Development Bank and also my colleague uh, Miguel from the OECD. And uh, happy also to introduce our great cohort of speakers for the first roundtable discussion, who will tell us more about the different mechanisms applied uh, by city authorities across Europe when it comes into participatory planning, and also the different mechanisms that they have managed to put uh, and, and also uh, integrate the great work of the communities into the center of the urban transformations. Here, I also want to just to emphasize more when we speak about participatory planning is that the key objective of this first panel discussion is to understand more and investigate on how uh, this approach of uh, being an urban planning paradigm and a systematic effort that emphasizes on involving the entire community in reaching a given socioeconomic goal and also trying to support them in their approach in diagnosing their problem, as well as charting the course of action to resolve, to resolve them. Without further ado, uh, please allow me to introduce our speakers, and I will start with our first speaker for today, uh, Ariana Emancol, who is the Director of Urban Strategy from the city of uh, Barcelona from Spain. Uh, Ariana is, the, is an architect and also a holder of Masters in Urban lab, Landscape, working at the city of Barcelona since 2007. And uh, most recently, she's been developing the Let's Protect School program and also the Barcelona Playable City strategy, as well as being responsible of the implementation of the Superblocks uh, program, who uh, we will get to learn more about in our first panel discussion for today. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Pekka, and, and Pekka uh, is actually the Deputy Mayor for Wellbeing, Promotion and Learning uh, from uh, the city of Kopio in Finland. And Pekka uh, Fakayontes has a PhD in Art History from the University of Jaska before becoming uh, Kopio's Deputy Mayor for Wellbeing, Promotion and Learning in 2011. He was also the city's cultural director and was the curator of Copio's Art Museum. Our third speaker today is Marlene Ten Verget, who's the program manager for Resilient uh, Portu 2028 a program from Rotterdam, from the Netherlands. Marlene is the district manager of uh, Pokio and the city of, of, of the, in the city of Rotterdam, and she's also uh, the, the program manager, and she's been working as the 10 years program in the ambition for Pokio to become the first resilient district in Rotterdam. Last but not least is our speaker from the city of Dublin, who is Dr. Sabrina Decker. She's the Climate Action Coordinator, uh, Environment and Transport Department in Dublin City Council. Sabrina has over 10 years of experience specializing in climate policy with focus on resilience in urban areas. She's also the author of the book of Cities Leading Climate Action, Urban Planning and Policy, holding PhD in Environmental Policy and Human Security and also a, a, an MPP in urban development and public health. And thanks, I would like to thank all of our speakers who are joining us for the first panel discussion. 
And uh, after this exciting, I would say, round of introductions, uh, please allow me just to come back to our audience very quickly with a quick uh, guidance to invite them to kindly ask questions to the panelists and have them in the QAE uh, uh, function in the chat and in order to be able to address your questions following the presentations of our speakers. With that, I would like to start with the intervention of our first speaker today, uh, Ariana from Barcelona. Thanks uh, for joining us, Ariana. And uh, now, uh, when we speak about participatory planning in particular, we cannot definitely overlook the great and interesting work that has been applied by Barcelona City Council as part of the Super Blocks program and the actions that has been applied in order to transform urban mobility patterns while also improving access to and quality of public and green spaces based on inclusive participatory approaches. With that, and knowing also and learning that there is also an approach of scaling up the Superblocks program, we would like to learn more from you on how does the city, what, what's actually the city approach when it comes into putting people into the center of the Superblock program. Ariana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Noha. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organization for your kind invitation. It's an, an honor to share this round table with you. Uh, yes, Barcelona has literally, literally and metaphorically put people uh, at the center of its policies. Literally, because as you can see in the images, people is, are working in the center of the street. We have designed a new street model conceived as a green infrastructure with improves, which improves people's comfort, promoting active and sustainable mobility. And metaphorically, because health and people are present in all the decisions. In 2020, Barcelona declared a climate emergency where one of the main objectives is the, to change the urban model to make a healthier, sustainable, fairer and more resilient city to be prepared for the new challenges that we will have to, to, to face. And one of the main strategies is the implementation of super blocks. Barcelona is a very dense uh, city. We are 1.6 million inhabitants in 100 square kilometers. We have a great lack of green, uh, of green space for per inhabitant. It is a city made of streets without large uh, green spaces. We have about six uh, square meters of green space per inhabitant, uh, but there are districts such as the Chambla, that is the central part of the city, that where we have less than two square meters of green per inhabitant. In addition, we have an obsolete mobility model, which leads to pollute, pollution problems, causing more than 350 premature death per year and other health problems. And it also, and it also uh, causes other effects such as high exposure to, to noise, with, which also causes illnesses or high growth accident rate. So we need to stop polluting and introduce more green. Superblock is a strategy that allows us to achieve these two object, objectives, but not only. Superblock is not only a project of public space, it is also about urban model. We need to promote urban density, capacity, mixed use, and urban uh, and, and a polycentric urban system to, to generate a short distance city. Superblocks is not a project of isolated areas. It's a rather it's rather a project of mobility network. We have we aim to improve all the streets, introducing bus and bike lanes and create more efficient mobility models reducing the public space dedicated to private transport and reducing pollution. It also provides a future vision for the whole city, a new environmental and social infrastructure that generates a systematic transformation where one of every three streets can become a green street as the, the street that you are seeing in the, in the slide. We know it works because uh, we have implemented in different places of the city. Seven years after of the first super blocks in Barcelona, we know that we have increased the space for pedestrians, but we also we have reduced uh, the traffic in the whole neighborhood, more or less at 
we we reduced atmospheric pollution and we and, and the commercial activity has increased and the social activities are increased a lot more or less five times five times more than than we used to to have before the super plot implementation so now is the time to scale up the project to the whole city the short and middle term actions of superblocks are located in a champlain the central district where we have the main problems of pollution and lack of green we expect to transform 21 streets and 21 squares in the next eight years the transformation started during the lockdown in 2020 uh, with tactical actions with the covid with the pandemic and now we are fine. Uh, we have uh, transformed these four uh, streets, and we now we are ending the works. But we are currently working to spread superblocks to all na the neighborhoods of of the city. And it's interesting that three new areas are promoted by neighbors through the participatory budget that they are demanding more superblocks. And finally, no, for for the new this new green street. Uh, we created this uh, this uh, green infrastructure with, infrastructure with five main points. Uh, it's a street understood as a new environmental infrastructure with more trees, more shadow, reducing temperatures, and introducing new water management solutions. We generate relations between the private and public realm, promoting social activities. We also are trying to put innovation in the materials and constructive solutions. And we also work in generate uh, a new landscape that needs to be integrated in the, in the heritage of the, of the city. And also we are working to warranty accessibility for everyone, focusing on the most vulnerable people also, no? as, as Elisa said. So it is a new kind of street, whereas where, as you can see, it, this is a photograph. It's a real. It's the reality. It's not a render. The people is in the really center no, of the of the street. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ariana, for for the the very interesting highlights on on the approach of the the, the city council and how really uh, these transformational initiatives can really take place, as you mentioned. It happened and you know that it can, can happen and be upscale. And you've seen the impact on, on not only the physical elements, but also how the social activities are increasing the health and well-being. So thanks, thanks a lot uh, for sharing those insights with us. And now uh, please allow me to move to our second speaker, uh, Pekka from Kopio. Uh, thanks a lot for, for joining us, uh, Pekka, in our uh, first roundtable discussions uh, for the webinar today. So uh, Copio has a culture of well-being promotion and has, it has already undertaken citywide enabling investments in developing cultural and sports uh, infrastructure in line with the city's objectives and its strategy to improve well-being of its residents. We would like to learn more from your, from your insights and your experience and how does Copio focus on well-being to inform its approach to strengthening community resilience in the face of the multiple overlapping crises? Because we're not, as, as Thomas have introduced at the beginning of the discussion, we're not looking only into climate change, but also we have the COVID socioeconomic crisis, Ukraine, a lot is going on. So I'm sure that there is a lot of great efforts that that insights that you can share with us today. The floor is yours, Becker. Thank you. Uh, greetings from Finland and the city of Kuopio. And uh, maybe the, uh, at the beginning, it is good to tell some general information about the city of Kuopio. Kuopio is located in central Finland and has population uh, uh, 100 2023, uh, 123,000. The city is eighth large, largest city in Finland. It was founded in uh, 1775. So we are about to celebrate the city's 250 uh, anniversary at 2025. The area of the city is more than 4,300 uh, 4, square kilometers. There are more than 1,000 square kilometers of lakes. The biggest lake is Kalavesi. 
over 2000 square kilometers are forest. So we literally live in the middle of the nature. People move to, uh, to the city from the surrounding areas, but also from other grow, growth centers in the country. Last year, the biggest migration can come from the capital region. Especially students are families with, uh, and families with children move to the city. In so surveys, the city has been the most popular from the point of view of families with children. And in COVID-19 time, we got uh, more uh, people from other cities. Um, about 100,000 inhabitants live in the central area of about 70 square kilometers, which is only about 2% of land area of the city. The city center is the most densely a densely populated center in Finland. The natural beauty, beautiful city is one of the Finland's most attractive cities. Mm. Sorry, uh, about 800 inhabitants lives in the city affected area. The city attraction is based on the University of the High Education Institute institutions. The education level is uh, a level of the population is typically high for uh, a university towns. More than 30% of population has university degree. Business life is versatile and focus on serv uh, service industries. In the city strategy, the goal is to be capital of good life in 2030. We aim to uh, aim for a good life by investing in preventive and proactive methods. Healthcare and social services are currently in a new organization, the uh, country level welfare areas. The change has clarified the city's role as the welfare promoter. For example, with the help of culture and exercise and by strengthening the sense of community. In the health, uh, healthy and uh, well-being copy of 2030 implementation program, the city committed to prom promoting good life, lifestyle. Uh, uh, aspects of good life are healthy routines, which means physical activity, rest and sleep, healthy food, people and community, family and safe, uh, safety net community, inspiring laser hobbies, voluntary activities, meaningful activity, learning and li livelihood, learning, training, work and livelihood. Uh, healthy and safe environment, nature, meeting places, and residence, safety uh, participation. Focus is uh, on happiness and good mood. The question was during COVID-19 and lockdown, how we are able to maintain citizens' ability to function, stay positive and physically active what the city can do for citizens' quality of life. The big, uh, beginning of the pandemic was difficult in many ways because there was no factual uh, information about the uh, severity of the diseases. Very quickly, we decided to establish, establish the multifunctional cooperation body which collected situ situational information about the pandemic daily, later two times at the week. Representative of healthcare and social services, education, daycare, culture, physical activities, environmental health and regional administration were invited to the cooperation body. In addition to official cooperation, the city assembled cooperation network which includes 
include representatives of various non-governmental organizations from the field of culture, sport, and civic activities. From the point of the, the second operation, it was good that, uh, uh, that we had invested in the school's digital devices, uh, devices even before the pandemic began. We recruited digital teaching skills from the teachers already in the recruitment phase. The transition of distance learning went well considering the situation. In Finland, children have the right to the school meals. It was difficult to organize it during the school closure, but it was also successful in the end in cooperation with the service provider. All parties understood the seriousness of the situation and approached the solution flexibly. Fortunately, the school closure were short lived uh, when we learned that children read, uh, rarely got serious ill from the pandemic. Still, some yeah. of the children had okay. time to get used to the idea that they don't have to come to the school every weekday. Afterwards, we have to do a lot of work of this issue. There is no compulsory schooling in Finland, but children guardians are su subject to compulsory education. Compulsory education extended up to the age of 18. This has been aimed to ensuring the everyday uh, adult fine has okay. at last second mm -hmm. degree at the better re uh, readiness, readiness to get a job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Becca. I appreciate it. And, and apologies for interrupting you, but we would love to hear more uh, from, from you uh, on, on the Q&A session. And also we'll come back to, to learn more about the city strategies on health and well-being. So thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. And now we would like to move into our next Apologies, I muted myself. So uh, I would like to introduce our third speaker today, Marlene from Rotterdam. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Marlene. And we would love also to hear from you uh, more about the POTU program that has been launched in 2018, but most importantly, how this program managed to, to succeed and having uh, one of its core features is inclusive and participatory planning where communities were into the core of it and ensuring that the voice of the groups the most the most i would say vulnerable and the most excluded are actually included in the process of the decision making process and succeeding in developing uh, the the development program uh, for the botu so with that uh, the floor is yours Marlene. i would love to hear more from you Thank you, Nuha. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Also an honor to uh, join this uh, group of interesting cities. Um, so let me start telling you a little bit about Bospolder and Tussedijk, uh, the two districts uh, in the west of Rotterdam that I'm actually um, the proud district manager of. Um, and, uh, Bospolder and Tussedijk can also referred to as BOTU. Um, are uh, two districts, like I said, in the west of Rotterdam. Uh, they are very uh, densely populated, uh, 14,000 people packed in one square kilometer. Um, it's a very lively, a very diverse, a very multi-ethnic community. Um, I think um, the district uh, has a history of um, residents that organize themselves in, in uh, communities, whether that's uh, culturally based, uh, religious based, um, uh, women groups, or just you know people that organize themselves within the street or a block, there uh, happens to be a strong sense of solidarity. Um, so I think that's one of the assets um, that the district has and that we wanted to use uh, by focusing on uh, community uh, resilience or social resilience. Um, we uh, think that for uh, sustainable resilience, 
uh, you need uh, the communities to be involved. So basically what we try to do uh, over the past, uh, well, the program has been launched in 2019, but we started even before that, um, is, is to uh, identify, uh, acknowledge um, as many different groups, uh, initiatives, uh, even individuals within the district that um, could have a, uh, a positive influence uh, in, the, in the districts. Um, we we try to uh, support those find those groups support those groups facilitate those groups and we try to also connect the dots between the different groups so uh, so that we actually create a strong network of uh, different communities within uh, the district um, we also create uh, strong and uh, we try to make them long-term uh, connection between informal parties and formal parties such as obviously uh, the municipality, but also uh, housing corporation, police force, um, and other uh, large institutions within the district. Um, by creating this network, we try to foster uh, strong levels of involvement and ownership, and um, that will come in very uh, helpful when you actually want to address bigger issues such as poverty, uh, climate adaptation, um, or even you know, COVID crisis or whatever. What really proved it really proved to be helpful during COVID that we could address all those communities to help us um, uh, coping with the crisis. Um, I think. Let me see. What I would also like to stress is that um, what we realized during the program um, is that if that we needed to go to take it one step further than just uh, the involvement of residents and you know the, the usual participation where it's always the municipality that starts and then um, uh, residents are are to follow they can maybe give their input but uh, most of all you know it's then this, the municipality officials still decide what happens with the input so we try we 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 tried to change that, and we made uh, we changed the program uh, with uh, in some important aspects of the program. So in two thousand twenty, uh, we tried to we decided to replace all city not all city officials, but um, a big group of city officials by um, members from within the community, and they became uh, project leaders. For example, on poverty, on employment on safety, on circularity. So now we're with, we are working, actually working with these community members on the uh, major themes within the districts. That was one, I think, very important feature that we changed. Um, another important thing that we've been working uh, with throughout the, uh, the program is uh, we're working with calls of action. Um, do I still have some time, Nuha? I think so. <laughs> Yeah. If you can wrap up, Marlene, that would be fantastic. Sure. sure. Let me just call two other uh, features that we changed. And uh, we introduced the calls of action. Um, that's an open call for community members or social entrepreneurs to come up with own projects and initiatives that will, you know, enhance uh, the districts. Um, so I think there you, the initiative is on the side of the community, not, not on the side of the city officials. And last but not least, we um, installed uh, a committee of, of BOTU uh, residents that decide whether these initiatives will be selected and funded or not. So it's no longer the municipality that decides, but it's the uh, residents themselves. And we were funded actually by a European Union right now, and they refer to this as community-led local development, where the community actually decides. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Merlin, uh, giving us these very interesting insights uh, and and how how you've you've actually 
uh, established or built on the strength of uh, the solidarities of the existing groups, that could have been a challenge, but you've used that as an opportunity to have a stronger participatory planning approach and take all of these uh, initiatives uh, forward, which we would definitely love to hear more from you on, on the second round of, of questions. But no, thank you. Thanks a lot for the very uh, interesting insights uh, from the program. Thank you. And now we would like to move into our, our last speaker uh, today, who is uh, from the city of Dublin, uh, Sabrina, who's joining us. And uh, and as, as we know, uh, Sabrina, about when we speak about, for example, climate change, and that's something also that, that have been introduced by our speaker from the city of Kopio, Pekka, and speaking about food programs. So I'm sure that you're going to tell us now more about how, when we speak about, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, we all know that uh, largely caused uh, by by and it's kindly linked to food but Dublin has made uh, a priority to involve communities in the path of achieving a just transition uh, when it comes into climate resilient future through managing food waste so uh, we would love to hear more from you if you can tell us about how how Dublin managed to partner with local communities to, to strengthen uh, climate resilience and address uh, issues around uh, food uh, uh, waste management and enhancing uh, uh, elements or maybe challenges around economic vulnerabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Nua. Um, delighted to be here and thank you for this opportunity to talk about a project that is quite close to my heart. Um, just a bit of background to this. Before joining Dublin City Council, um, I was working with Ireland's Climate Change Advisory Council Secretariat and I had the task of looking at the just transition and I had a colleague who is working on the agricultural sector for Ireland because Ireland is a agriculture is an important part of the culture and identity and he gave me a quote that was sitting in my head for a very long time you need the farmer to grow the apple to keep the doctor away um, and I would add to that and say you need the farmer needs the transport the roads to move their product to the city to where you can eat it at a restaurant and we need energy to cook the food so everything is interlinked so food and climate change is a really important topic for us and it's a great narrative for people to understand climate change because it's um it is something we have to do every day we need to eat every day and so that's kind of the background of it to eat the streets is um when i first joined dublin city council i was asked to join we have a creative creative ireland is a national body and they each they give funding to each of the local authorities in ireland and dublin city council receives small amount of funding and we divided up within the council so we were given seven thousand to come up with a creative project around climate action so i said to my manager at the time let's do food and climate change um she said yes let's do it because it again the background is we didn't have we don't discuss food in ireland enough because our sector we we are actually very, very dependent on food imports to meet our food needs. So that's what led to Eat the Streets. Um, so with the support of the Arts Office, we started looking at how we might build this project. And it is a collaborative project. So we were advised to look at um, Michelle Darmody, who is a food writer for the Irish Examiner. So we brought her in and she actually owned her own restaurant in the city. So had a good sense of that, what was going on in the city around food. Then she introduced us to the wonderful artist, Niall Sweeney, who designed the face that you're staring at, uh, who came up with this design around making vegetables and interacting. And the great part about this is we actually had the first year we did this in 20. 2020-21, um, a parent emailed us and asked for a poster of this for their child's third birthday. So great to have that compliment come to us. So we had to send that. The spirit of the project is though that it is collaborative. So in addition to them, we identified a few local chefs who were brought in to kind of bring together. So we had Connor Spacey, who is Ireland's ambassador to the World, World Food Program, Dan Keane, who is a fantastic chef in the city centre. And we chose that restaurant because the northeast inner city of Dublin has a lot of challenges around social deprivation. Um, and it is an area where we don't have a lot of greening. We also had Katie, um, Katie Quinn from Lilliput Stores in Stony Batter, another area that's kind of emerging, but quite 
quite into food and supporting local Irish producers. And then Owen Meldon from Little Bird Cafe on the south side of the city. Again, they're kind of one of the few restaurants that supports vegan and vegetarian. And they're one of the first to lead out on it. So with the, that small team, we started crafting a project and crafting our program for the first year. And the first year was challenged by the fact that we were, Ireland had the longest lockdown. Um, so we were in lockdown, planning for lockdown. So we did cook-alongs that were recorded in March, and that was timed with a call out to public to do grow, cook and create with us. So we invited people to grow starting in March with the growing season and we had support from Grow It Yourself Ireland, Incredible Edibles, which is AgriAware's program around growing. So we engaged with schools and, and youth and stuff to actually start growing and through our libraries as well, because Grow It Yourself was providing seed packets. Um, so cook-alongs and the cook-alongs of the idea with the initial bit was to ask chefs to cook a recipe from their childhood to bring an intergenerational piece in. So Katie did probably my favorite recipe and it's still on the website. So if you're interested in it, it's taking mashed potatoes and adding vegetables into it and pan frying it from, so it's just delicious because it's breaded and almost fried. So highly recommend that recipe. The chefs all kind of gave their story behind the recipe as well. And Owen had a great story about how his mother was the only vegetarian in a family of butchers. So we had all these stories intertwined into it that were put onto the website, which was designed by um, Connor Cahill, who runs a project, runs Fluid Edge. And it's it's interactive. So the design of the website is meant to encourage users to flow through the website and add their ideas, their contributions, whether that's pictures of food, a recipe, or stories. So on the Discover page, we have stories of my favorite one is two young children in Dublin who have their urban farm and they gave ideas on how to grow food um, around that. So these were all added into that. We also had um, tourism added in with 17th century eating supported by a writer who looked at Jonathan Swift and what was eaten in 17th century Dublin, medieval Dublin, and looking at Viking Dublin. So that was all in the lead up into June when we actually hosted the festival, which we kind of ran over a week online. Unfortunately for us, we got out of lockdown, so everybody was free on the streets, but we kept our after dinner chats in the evening designed that nobody had to give a presentation and people could pick up their phone, listen to the after dinner chat in the park while enjoying enjoying their freedom from COVID. Um, for the after dinner chats, we kind of focused on young people and their experience with food and their vision for a healthy food system in the future. We had international examples with um, Michael Abelman from Vancouver around soul food street farms and the city of Calgary and Calgary Eats program. And then we also had a discussion with academics in Ireland who were look at food sharing and how we address that. And we also had talks around ending food waste and that led us to the quote that we keep going with is uh, stopping food waste is the climate action you can take three times a day so that was the first year and in the second year we've just only as you can see from this just did this in September 2022 and we're looking to do it again this year in September 2023 again um, it's been a great project it's I don't know what else to say like it is the, the whole spirit of it is to actually drive action by communities to, to lead out on it and demonstrate and to grow that experience. Um, the idea is that we do keep it driven by what the market wants, what, what public wants to learn and how we support small and medium enterprises in the food sector. I think I'm at time. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Sabrina, for not just sharing, I would say, the experiences from 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 Dublin, but also sharing your your own energy and and as you mentioned, uh, by managing or, or or contributing to 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 managing climate changes by managing food waste three times a day, which makes a lot of sense. Hope oh, it's not more than three times a day, but yeah. <laughs> that's very valid point so thank you thanks thanks a lot uh sabrina for that and with that maybe we can move into the second uh, round of of questions for our speakers and and here uh, i think it it's a very interesting insight that has been shared by 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 our different speakers on different elements uh, thinking about uh, uh greening our streets and then moving into into elements of health and well-being and how let's say the geographical uh, interest or or the the element around around uh, the city of Kopju, how did it really strengthen the strategies of of health and well-being and then moving into how the engagement of the different different community groups and, and bringing them not only from participation with their with their ideas but also being leaders for projects and then also bringing up the aspects of, of, of food waste management and, and the impact on climate change. 
So with that, please allow me maybe to to address uh, the first uh, the first uh, question here, and and start by 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 bringing maybe uh, the insights from uh, the Botu project and and sharing some points uh, with you, uh, Marlene, around the elements of of social resilience as you have have highlighted or maybe indicated in in your intervention that it, you moved from from just the fact of just bringing people into the table sharing their ideas but actually being leaders of projects. So I'm sure that there must have been some, some not only challenges, but also opportunities for building capacities and bringing some technical training and an innovative, let's say, insights for these community leaders to become practitioners and become contributors to the, to, to the BOTU uh, program. So we would love to, to hear more from you on that and some of the key lessons learned. Okay, well, that's quite a challenge to do this in three minutes, but um, I'll try to share at least some. I think, first of all, uh, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that this is a, a slow food, not fast food, as we used to call it. Um, it really requires a long time to invest in communities and to first, as you mentioned, to really invest in capacity building. I have a lot of colleagues that you know, are also inspired by our way of working and that they think that they can, you know, create this within one or two years. And I don't think you can because you really need to install a thick layer of community involvement, thick foundation. I think in Botu there's maybe, you know, I don't know, thousand, maybe 1500 people that are now committed or involved in one way or the other. And from that foundation, you can move on and take um, take a next step. So I think that's um, because otherwise it's very vulnerable. If you only have, you know, twenty or thirty uh, committed citizens, it's very easy that it that it um, yeah you know that it collapses. So that's one thing. Uh, the the second thing is, and you mentioned it already in your introduction, is that it's very important to 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 train people um, because when you uh, what we realized when we um, organized our decision-making processes and you and different people of different levels enter at the table, there's, you know, there's no equality between the several members around the table. So it may look like you're very inclusive and you have a lot of participants there, but it's just actually just a few people that are actually in the discussion and in the debate and in the decision-making. So how do you prevent you know, that from happening? And how do you really give all people at the table the same uh, yeah, level uh, or involvement in the decision-making processes? So we started working with um, deep democracy processes um, and we use a lot of training so that people are not just thrown into the process and then are either disappointed or overwhelmed or are feel not safe enough to join. So I think, first of all, invest, you know, it, it, takes, it takes time and do also um, and put a lot of uh, effort in training and guiding the people, your, your, your citizens. Otherwise you get an, an inequality, you know, between either city officials or between even residents themselves among themselves. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Marlene, for sharing these uh, very interesting insights and, and lessons uh, from your experience. Uh, with that, maybe I would like to move into, into Pekka and, and uh, reflect on some of the, the, the interesting points and also the, the strategy that you have shared with us on, on health and well-being, but maybe also learn more from your, from your, uh, from Copio's experience and, and considering the different, let's say, challenges is uh, not only considering the geographical, let's say, uh, uh, element or, or interesting element of the city, but also how, how the, the demographics are really contributing to this uh, participatory planning approach. Yes, thank you. As I told, uh, well-being promotion is an important part of our strategy, our vision is to become a capital of good life. It's <laughs> quite a high vision and uh, our well-being promotion goals and activities are described 
in a detail in our happy and healthy Kuopio 2030 implementation program where um, uh, where system approach also referred as well-being promotion ecosystem approach. We have a strong emphasis on cross-organizational and multi-sectoral cooperation. We have created a structure for collaboration, which has provided to be fluent and effective tool for supporting community resilience, particularly during emergencies, crises such as COVID-19 pandemic and uh, war in Ukraine. We use this same organization uh, nowadays uh, with refugees from Ukraine. We set our well-being promotion goals together with our stakeholders based on emerging da data. We create a well-being promotion ecosystem where we share common goals, but each organization reaches for the target using their own exper expertise and resources according to their duty and responsibilities. It is very important that the residents of the city participate in the planning of services and have their own role in the implementation. We use service design to help this work. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Pekka. Very, very interesting uh, key lessons learned uh, indeed, and, and hopefully other cities also can learn from such experiences as well. And uh, maybe with that, I will move to, to Sabrina and, and also share with us some of your, uh, let's say, key lessons, uh, but that or maybe tips that you'd like to, to uh, put into the table for other cities to take forward. I think my first tip is one thing we learned last year was measure a pizza oven before you try to bring it into a heritage building. Otherwise, you end up in big trouble <laughs> with the uh, thing with the host of the event. Um, for us, I think it's it's been really kind of one of the, the one of the key things for us was actually not saying the project was about climate change, and so we kind of treated it a bit like Mary Poppins, um, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And we did focus, we advertised it as a food festival and it was all about food. Um, and I think the dem it would succeeded in doing that because people thought it didn't come from my department. They thought it came from culture, recreation and economic services, even though it was environment and transport. So it was a good way to kind of bring people in. And we kind of, only in the last year did we kind of start saying this is about climate action because we're just lining up with the conversation around people wanting more climate action. So it was responsive to what people are asking for. And I think that's been the key to the success of it is knowing kind of what what is happening and what communities are asking for. So it was there, people asked for it. So, I mean, this year we're trying to evolve it a little bit more to kind of focus on SMEs and how they're supported in creating a stronger food system. So it's slow, we're building it and similar to Marlene, it's like, it's a slow process, it is very slow. It's also why we were looking at growing was to kind of draw people's attention to like, you know, getting your hands in the soil and understanding how long it takes something to grow. And I should mention, I am not a growing expert. I've managed to kill cactus in my life. So it is about, you know, letting people understand that these processes take time. And it is a great way to kind of, I think the other lesson um, in a lot of my research in previous life was like narratives. And I think Ireland, people don't always think food, but we do have a strong food heritage and people learning about that and getting interested in it, that it's, it's worked. So picking something that kind of sparks people's imaginations has also been a valuable lesson for us. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that, that just uh, builds up on, as well on, on Pekka's point around culture and how, how, you know, strengthening culture from different perspectives can really bring communities together and have their, their uh, participatory uh, approach into, into planning more strengthened and building resilience. Uh, with that, I would just like to give the floor to our last speaker, Adriana, with a few reflections and on the key lessons from the Superblock Initiative. Yeah, uh, in my experience, uh, for, for us, it was important 
first of all, to have a final vision and a strong political will, because these changes are not easy to, to implement, and you have to be strong, and you have to, to have this political support. Then participatory processes and community engage, engagement, as you have said, to be sure that you have the important people with you, as Marlene said, no? that the stakeholders that have influence in that area, no? that to, to be sure that you have with you, even if they are against the project, because you have to be, no? to, to have them on the board. Uh, and also to have, to, to, to be proactive and looking for new challenge mm, channels, new audiences, no? to, to have to, to search different channels to, to reach the people and to, to arrive to maximum of uh, people as, as possible. And focus on health. No? I, for us, it helps a lot no? to have these uh, arguments on health. Also climate change, but I think that health is more understandable, understandable for the people and they understand that a change is is uh, necessary, no? And then focus and look for specific groups, no? With the specific needs, no? Uh, maybe with this gender approach, looking for a woman or looking for, for people that is blind and, and, and you will need to explain it, no? In a, in a different way and trying to, to bring their, their views and concerns uh, into the strategy and, and the projects, no? Then flexibility. You have a model, but you have to be flexible, and it's uh, it's important to adapt to a different urban fabrics and also to different uh, social realities. To be clear that, that you have a tool, but it, you you don't have a, a closed project. And and we you no, know, you understand super ruthless. Like we are also always learning and improving, and and with. Each iteration of the project, no, we are improving and, and learning from the people also. And it's important that they see that you are implementing their, no, their thoughts and their concerns. For and for this reason, it's important to evaluate also to have data to know if it's working, see if you are improving, no, and and, and in each implementation to to learn and, and how to improve, to know. And also to correct if it's necessary unexpected effects, and also to disprove misconceptions because more a lot of times, uh, because uh, people uh, you know, feels different perceptions, but it's not the reality. And you need data to say no, no, it is not. It's not like that. And we have data, and we know that it works or, or not, and it's very important. And finally, time as Marlene and Sabrina uh, had said, and also Pekka, uh, once the time to, to talk with people before the transformation is made, and after the transformation, wait. And don't, no, uh, and don't take decisions if it's working or not. You have to wait more or less two or three years minimum no, to, to know if it's working or not. So the, these changes need time. And that's all. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Tariana. And, and as you mentioned, time. And I think translating time into action equals ownership. So the more time we give them to decide is, is all about having their ownership. So thank you. Thanks a lot for having your contributions, all uh, Sabrina, Ariana, Marlene and Pekka. It was a fantastic uh, discussion. And I would like to end up by handing over to our colleague from CEV, uh, Elisa, for the second round of discussions. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Nua and the panelists for a very interesting and engaging discussions and for sharing their insights. We are now moving to the second roundtable discussion, and it's my pleasure to introduce Miguel Vidal Bover, who is a policy analyst in the Decentralization, Subnational Finance and Infrastructure Unit of the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions, and Cities. Miguel will be moderating the second roundtable discussion. So, Miguel, um, over to you. The floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you so very much, Elisa, for your introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Indeed, my name is Miguel Vidal, and I work as a policy analyst at the OECD. A very warm welcome to you all to the second roundtable, uh, which I'm very happy to be moderating today. Indeed, we've seen from the first uh, roundtable that we can have excellent projects. We have heard about projects in the first roundtable related to climate change, health, and food, for example. But so we have we can have these excellent projects, but we need to find the financing for them to become a reality. And as Mr. Ericsson said in the beginning, cities cannot do this alone and they need finance. And so this requires innovative and sustainable solutions to be able to prioritize financing and implement investments that boost the resilience of a city or a region uh, over the short, medium, but also the long term. And so this includes, for example, financing green projects. And we at the OECD, we have developed the Subnational Government Climate Hub to better estimate the expenditure and the investment gaps that cities and regions face in implementing their climate adaptation and mitigation objectives. And among the key findings, it came out that cities and regions in the OECD and the EU account for 63% of climate significant public spending and also 69% of climate significant investment on average in 2019. So cities have a strong role in financing initiatives that increase resilience. And so this is what we're going to talk today here uh, with a very interesting lineup of speakers. So without further ado, let me introduce the panel of speakers very briefly. Uh, joining from the city of Tbilisi is Anna Ardelian. Uh, since 2014, she held a variety of senior positions in the mayor's office, including the head of vice, ma vice mayor's office and the head of international relations department until 2017. And this is when she became the first chief resilience officer of Tbilisi and was in charge of leading the efforts of Tbilisi to become part of the Resilient Cities Network, among many other projects upon which she will commend. Next, uh, we jump now to the opposite side of Europe and we go to Cascais in Portugal. Uh, joining from there is Joao Diniz, uh, who is serving as Climate Action Director at Cascais Ambiente, where he has been developing climate change and sustainable development strategies through innovative approaches for the last 15 years. So to be concrete, he contributed to the implementation of over 40 climate actions in the last five years. And he has extensive experience in leading pilot cases for EU finance projects, as well as Portuguese funding, with over 20 finance projects in the last decades alone. So welcome, uh, Joao. Um, Stefania Manka is also with us. Uh, she is, as of uh, June 2022, the Resilience and Sustainability Manager at the Municipality of Genoa in Italy, and also serves as the coordinator of the Climate Adaptation Partnership of the Urban Agenda for the EU. Stefania also holds a Master's in uh, Information Systems um, for the Territory and the Environment from Genoa University, and she's an expert evaluator and an EU project coach. So welcome. Um, finally, before we begin, I, as, as Elisa mentioned, I regret to inform you that one of our esteemed uh, speakers, Donieta Sahatiu, the Deputy Mayor of, of Pristina, will unfortunately not be able to join us uh, due to a medical urgency that arose unexpectedly. So we send, of course, our sincerest um, best wishes for a speedy recovery. So now, uh, welcome everybody, and thank you very much for being here. Let me just remind you, uh, remind the audience um, that they can send their questions during the panel discussion through the Q and A function on Zoom. And if time allows, uh, we will be able to ad address some, if not all of them, at the end of the session. Now, let us dive right into the subject of the this roundtable on developing sustainable financing solutions. Anna. Uh, if that's okay with you, uh, let's start with you to talk about financing resilience. Indeed, we know that Tbilisi has approved its resilience strategy for 2030, and it is becoming a more resilient city day by day. So, Absolutely. Exactly. So behind the scenes, I, I imagine that a lot of work must be being done. So could you share with us in, in five minutes the challenges and perhaps the opportunities that Tbilisi is facing to finance its, its resilience strategy? Sure. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me on such an in interesting webinar. Um, to introduce you, my uh, city, Tbilisi, is capital of Georgia, which is uh, which population is 1.3 million. Um, we share border with Turkey, Russia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and we're next to the Black Sea. So Tbilisi is a very old city. We have history goes back in. 15 centuries, more than 15 centuries. So as you understand, we have gone throughout the centuries through lots of <clears throat> challenges. And um, my country is very resilient, I could say. And that was one of the reasons uh, Resilient City Network has accepted Tbilisi in his network. Um, so resilient was, resilient was in general strange word for us. We literally had to translate, find a proper word. So it was a big challenge for the city to start talking about resilience. And I'm very proud, as you mentioned, that we have released resilience strategy in 2019, that uh, we still have it and we're proud of it. Um, so resilience strategy uh, compared, uh, comprises of three pillars and uh, divided into a 10 goals and 42 different actions. Uh, which are some of the um, projects that uh, we're proud of. Um, as you understand, we went through a Soviet era and Tbilisi has inherited lots of Soviet structures. They're outdated and um, unstable. And unfortunately, um, uh, some of the kindergartens are on, in these old structures. So one of the shocks for the city is uh, earthquake. And uh, as you understand, some of the stresses would be uh, aging infrastructure. So currently Tbilisi has 187 existing kindergartens and from which 33 are new and uh, 154 are old. Uh, right now we're, uh, we're hosting 61,000 children, but it's still not enough. Um, Tbilisi kindergartens um, um, are free for our citizens and uh, it's high demand. Um, so cities try to push new constructions, new buildings, and financing is very challenging for the city because uh, as many investors would like to invest in a good uh, projects, unfortunately, kindergartens are not um, profitable enough for them to invest. So city really has challenges to uh, mobilize funds uh, to build new kindergartens and evaluate old ones and rebuild, like demolish, rebuild, or uh, reinforce. But we're slowly are uh, still moving. If you um, see on the slide, there's 33 new kindergartens we have built um, this couple of years. 10 new kindergartens are still on the way, and just three are going to open by September. Um, capacity cost for kindergarten is 1.5 million US dollars. So again, it's not um, cheap investment, uh, but city is uh, working with the central government and we're using our um, in-house um, budgets to finance all the projects. Um, but we also are working in parallel uh, outside the kindergartens uh, with the bus infrastructure and public infrastructure projects. Uh, some of the um, main stresses for the city was <clears throat> poor air quality. And this is the project that we're proud of that Tbilisi has replaced every single bus in the city uh, with the new Euro 6 um, CNG, uh, Euro 6 diesel or brand new bus fleets. Um, we are putting bus lanes throughout the cities and uh, we are <clears throat> creating brand new infrastructure for the new buses. So city becomes more um, um, pedestrian oriented versus car oriented city that we used to be. Uh, for this uh, purpose, city has used financing starting from city's own budget, central government, and also we've had to use the international finance organizations to help us out with uh, financing the buses. So as you understand, uh, it's a huge challenge for the city, but having a resilient strategy, having a guide and having the support from uh, financial institutions are 
uh, super important uh, to deliver our resilience message and resilience strategy actions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I, I think we could see very concretely uh, the, 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 finance, the financing challenges regarding, you mentioned the, the renovation or the rebuilding of kindergartens and, and, and the replacement of, of bus fleets uh, in, in Tbilisi. But also we could see the ways to, to rise up to them and, and, and overcome them as much as possible. Perhaps we will, uh, we will talk about it in the second round of questions. You mentioned you know, different sources or, the, or a diverse basket uh, of, of, of sources of financing uh, to, 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 to get to these objectives and to promote um, resilience. So thank you so much for, for, for your insights. I think they're very interesting to all of us. Uh, I am I'm now off to, to you, Joao. Um, as we heard from Anna, and, and as we know, uh, financing is extremely important for, for resilience, but citizens must also be involved and have a say, right? And, and, and in this regard, participatory budgeting can be a powerful tool for strengthening community resilience uh, and leave no one behind. And this is why basically you're here. You know, Cascades has one of the most effective participatory budget models in Europe. So I'd like to ask you in, in, in five minutes, could you tell us a bit more about the experience of Cascais in implementing participatory budgeting to strengthen community resilience? Yeah, hello. Uh, good morning. I am extremely happy to be sharing today a bit of our expertise. Um, so Cascais is a coastal town in the outskirts of the Lisbon metropolitan area. And we are stuck between the ocean and the natural heritage mountain range. So obviously we have a beautiful uh, landscape and heritage, natural heritage to take care of, but we also have beautiful and inspiring people as well, of course. So in, for us to promote uh, our, our heritage, like I mentioned, to the future net generations, to make sure that everyone from the future generations are able to enjoy, just as I am doing that today, this, this, the, the beautiful opportunities that Kishkaij has, uh, we need to make sure that they are properly heard. So when we talk about a very recurrent uh, project that the majority of cities are already, already doing, which is a participatory budgeting, uh, we are considering a project that hears people. So if you have an idea, if you, you individually or collectively, for example, if you are a member of an NGO, if you're a member of the Scouts, if you're a member of a school, uh, if you're you know, a, an active member of your local neighborhood community, you can bring out your ideas and you can try and sell them uh, to other participants and the relevance that your ideas have to contribute to a more inclusive, more sustainable uh, municipality. Of course, this methodology, like I mentioned, it's very recurrent, uh, it's stabilized, and it allows people to, people's voices to be heard. And of course, when you do this, uh, according to the selection criteria, you will have to submit an idea that actively contributes to the quality of life of the citizens. We can go on with uh, how many criteria, but generally let's just say these are the ones. And of course, we are now on the oh, well over 10 editions already. Uh, every year we have more ideas, more, more heart pumping into the building of this beautiful place. And of course, it's something that we are striving to hear because it has a lot of dividends, both politically and both uh, objectively as a technician, which I am. So, but it doesn't end here. So when we are talking about sustainable development and climate action, for example, we developed something a bit different, which is a bit complementary, and it turns out to be a great success. Like the participatory budgeting, it's highly replicable, but it has a significant uh, difference. I'm talking about the ADAPT Kishkaish Fund, which is a climate adaptation fund. And what we are doing is doing uh, a call for action. And basically, when you have a participatory budgeting, you are giving the opportunity people to say, I have an idea, I have a contribution. Would you, the town hall, will be able to implement my idea? And then this would be subjective to voting. What we are doing is something complementary, which is climate change is, is a systemic challenge. We need everyone to be on board of this challenge, tackle this challenge. What can you do to complement the actions of us, the town hall? That is the question that we put out on the ADAPT Kishkaij Fund. And that's the difference or the complementary that we have here. That means that we are empowering you through a funding and technical support 
So you implement your own idea because we see value in it. So this uh, project, like the participatory budgeting, all it needs is funding and a regulation that you can apply. And that's all, it's that simple. So I can give you, you can go to our website today. Uh, both regulations are, are available online and you can easily replicate in your city. So again, they do have a lot of dividends. First one is, let's be honest, they have better ideas than, than I do, for example. <laughs> I travel the world, I see the best projects, I benchmark, but someone comes along and they always have a greater idea. Even if it's by merging and bringing other citizens on board and they can do that better than I can because they bring their own community. And of course, if, you, if one project brings their own community, another project, then you have 10 projects and you have a long, you know, a very inspiring community working on the same mission that I am working, for example, which is to safeguard this beautiful landscape. Um, when we are talking about a participatory budgeting, I would say there are a few challenges and hurdles that we are probably facing because of our own success, but we have a wonderful team there at the, the civic participation department and that's taking care of this. On the climate uh, adopt, the Kashkai's adopt fund, we are also tackling new challenges because we found out this is quite innovative to empower people and give them the funds and the capacity to implement their own idea to complementary to our work. It's something that is completely new at the city scale. And this is quite easy to do, like I've said. So we are still learning and we are making sure that we can replicate this every year. And so you don't see this as a one shot experience. Like participatory budgeting that we have been going out years after years, the number of cities that use this tool have been increasing. We need for climate action and for sustainable development to make sure that we also have the opposite, which is we empower people so they can act, not just us. And this is the difference again. This is the greatest uh, asset of these types of approaches. It's the empowerment. And if you have people empowered and qualified to do work, uh, you will have um, much more success, I would say. And so the millions of euros that we've already implemented have been extremely successful and impactful. And on the Adapt Kishkaish Fund, for example, I would say that the value for money is probably, in my opinion, personal opinion, it's probably the best value for money that I have ever seen. Because if we, we give 3,000 euros to each NGO and what they give us back, it's tenfold uh, of what they give, what, what we give them. And that's, uh, that's something to consider, definitely. Oh, we will definitely consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joao, for, for these insights. Uh, I think I, I noted it down. I mean, it is important to have projects, but it is important to have projects that listen or projects that allows uh, people's voices to, to, to be heard. And, and you shared the experience of the, also the, the, the complementary, let's say, Cascade Adaptation Fund that gives this agency to, to all actors or, or, or empowers all stakeholders, right, who may have even better ideas than, than, than you, than me, than, than anyone in this in this call. So this is uh, extremely interesting for us. Indeed, it, participatory budgeting and, and even priority-based budgeting more generally can be key for resilience. If they if it is implemented adequately, you, you mentioned you had some challenges as well. Maybe this is something that we will touch upon in the second round of questions. But this is in, indeed a key component of the OECD Subnational Government Climate Hub that I mentioned earlier and which we have developed a set of, of guidelines on financial resilience and a self-assessment tool to support cities and regions in implementing and, and strengthening these uh, green budgeting practices and, and, and priority-based uh, budgeting more generally. So another city that has made strides towards more and more resilience is the city of Genoa. And Stefania, you were very much there when the city of Genoa approved its uh, first resilience strategy in 2019. It has now been a few years now, uh, ever since. And so how has Genoa integrated resilience into its municipal investments and how did it mobilize funds to implement the resilience strategy that you approved in, uh, back in, in 2019? Thank you. Thank you, Mikkel. Thank you to <laughs> so much life. <laughs> I hope this is easy for all of you to understand what we did. 
uh, I'll try to testify an experience of a city that, like other cities in the world, has been hurt so many times for uh, um, the climate-related effect or man-made accident that was absolutely necessary to change paradigm and to change views and to look at the city as a new project. And uh, to do something that was really useful for the communities and for the city itself, it was necessary to learn something more. So the business as usual was not absolutely uh, sustainable, no, not even more, because we need to change. And so we did it. I hope that all other cities could do the same, because if uh, we, as a medium-sized city with uh, 600,000 people, and uh, we are particular because we are a, a mountain cities on the sea, so we have a combined struggling issue from both sides, and we are quite squeezed. <laughs> and, uh, and to be honest, uh, uh, we decide to focus our uh, city resilience strategy in studying the effect the local effect of these super global mega trends that does the demographic change, the climate change, and also the digital transition. We use all of the, uh, we studied the future scenarios at 2050 and 2060 and more, but prefer to stay on 2050. And then we downscale them at local level in order to better understand what the city will look like, which will be the future. And then we invite all the interested parties, the private investor on one hand, or obviously the public department, and also the other level of governance in a multi-level governance approach, we, we establish a new kind of relationship, informal and participatory. Uh, this process uh, put on the same uh, uh, table people that, for instance, after the bridge collapsed in 2018, lose lives, lose work, lose everything, together with the government, the regional, the metropolitan, the national, and also the local, all together to find solution because climate change and exactly the same what I told before, the demographic change and the digital transition could help on one hand, but also struggle on the other. So we elaborate a, a plenty of scenarios and uh, based on these scenarios, we uh, decide the priority and then we downscale a strategy. This document is available uh, for free online, is both in Italian and English, and uh, it is operationalized by the action plan for a green city, you know, look into, okay, the lighthouse city strategy is the resilient strategy at 30, 60 degrees, because one thing is not absolutely underlinked. Everything is connected. All of us are connected. All of us are facing the same challenge. We are. Uh, we need to improve our capacity to intercept and to prevent, and not more to restore and to respond. But we need to prevent, to anticipate, to innovate. Also, the financing scheme. What we did was to analyze completely the municipality budget and uh, to put in evidence the vulnerability of that budget because what not uh, sustainable in terms of climate change, demographic change, and digital transition issue. We combine the municipality budget, so the municipality own budget, with additional funds. The RDF funds with the using the operative plan, for instance, for metropolitan cities using ES, uh, ES funds um, and using the private investor funds, we combine different private investor opportunities from the banks, from the bank foundation, and uh, from also partnership uh, that could, uh, um, that could um, work together in design in the future. But the super issue was we don't scale the impact, we, draw together the project and we um, underline uh, that was necessary to adopt a new metrics. So we decide to adopt a new framework of indicators that was um, that use both the international frameworks of indicators for resilience and we don't scale and adapt it at local level. Because the issue to intercept the, the majority of the new funds that we ha now have is uh, that 
you have to draw projects that are in line in what the international community wants that the city does. Uh, the city do, sorry. And also the European Commission too asked to the city to do things in order to strengthen resilience. But not all the cities are really aware of what they could do and what and how they could act. And so this in this case, we we use three separate strategic program reinforcing the project one to each other bouncing it in a sort of ping pong uh, if we can say at administrative level in order to give really really reinforcing and mainstreaming message so we use the urban plan for instance that is the main documents that for the that draw the future the resilience strategy the action plans that was okay the CCAP. And then we frame the municipality budget using the additional funds in all the projects that are foreseen in all these documents. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefani. I think there's a lot of food for thought there. I mean, you talked about, for example, the, the, the foresight exercise that you did with all stakeholders around the same table to devise scenarios and 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 find solutions towards, you know, towards boosting this resilience and at the end. And you also talked about the very interesting process about you know a full analysis of the municipal budget, then focusing on the vulnerabilities that you may see from the different mega trends and, and then combine it with different streams of financing. So I think this is extremely interesting. Perhaps we'll go back to it in the second round of questions. And actually with this, we close a, a very interesting first uh, round of questions. I, I know that we are already receiving some questions from the public, but just to remind you that you can keep sending them uh, using the Q&A function. And if time allows, of course, we will address them at the end of, of this session. Now, let's open a quick second round of questions. Um, we have heard about the challenges and the opportunities as well to develop uh, innovative financing, financing solutions for sustainable development. And I would like to ask you uh, a, a bit more, perhaps, uh, on the lessons learned in your diverse experience. Uh, what, what is most important when it comes to securing the financing for your projects? What, what have you learned from it? Uh, what works best and what could be improved, perhaps? Uh, so perhaps uh, let's start with you, uh, Joao. Uh, you, you mentioned as well uh, several experiences uh, and you also referred to several challenges. Um, so perhaps you could share a bit more about uh, those challenges that you've been exper uh, experiencing, but also how you've sought to overcome them, uh, both in relation to participatory budgeting, but also the Climate Adaptation Fund. So I would say um, at uh, an early stage, thought of it uh, with the necessity to follow up the timing. So if we do the participatory budget, for example, you have a time a timing for applications to submit applications and for voting, but then you do have a timing for implementation. And I would say that the main uh, challenge is when you drive an idea, which is an abstract concept in someone's head and you share it with someone, it's still a relatively abstract concept. And when you make it something more tangible, that's when you pass to the technical and they will analyze, well, this is actually easy to do or not, or this is according to regulation or not, or this is the lead licensing and regulation it needs to follow. And that's when challenges usually happen. Uh, in, in any participatory uh, project or endeavor that any city has to, to, to go through, uh, it can happen in sports, it can happen in culture, whatever that is. I would say that's the biggest challenge is to make sure that we don't close down on good ideas with our preconcepts of uh, what has to be done. I know usually what are the processes for project management because we are all project managers in one way or another. But what happens is once you uh, drive that idea or that ambition of a person, of a group of person, and to make sure that everything is transcribed now into a project, that's the biggest challenge. And that's when time timing derails, that's when you turn out that's not relatively possible. And that's the, the, you know, that you have to explain to people and go on again on a dialogue to make sure that they understand. Your idea turns out we need to change a bit. I would say that's the biggest challenge that we face. We have others, uh, but I'll leave it for, for later on because this is probably 50% of the challenges that we face on, on these 
sort of project. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we were hearing also about this issue about, you know, needing to be flexible in the first round table, right? Like you, 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 you have timing uh, that is pushing you in one direction, then you have the feasibility of the project and you need to communicate how feasible a project is to, to, to the, the ones that put it forward. So yeah, indeed a, a challenge, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, from what you said that there are many ways to overcome this. I don't know if, if Stefania or Anna want uh, have had like, perhaps Stefania, have you had, have you, have you had any similar experiences in, in, in your time in, in, in Genoa? And so have, ha, what, what have you learned from, you know, implementing this uh, resilience strategy in terms of finding the different sources of financing, making everyone participate, communicate, adapt uh, in those different cycles of, of the project management and all of this in perhaps three minutes? Sure. Um, uh, me or Anna? I don't know. Uh, I don't, I mean, I would, I would perhaps, let's go for Stefania first okay. uh, and then since she went last, so, and then, and then Anna, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, I could try to share the the super issue that we have to face. And I think that we need to, to continue to face because uh, we need also to transform. And the, the issue is not related to funding, funding source or projects, but the language that we use to communicate to the people, to the politician, because you need to have the politician aware on board and helping to mainstream what uh, you as a practitioner or a, a technician or a super expert knows, but the politician looks to, uh, they have a political cycle mandate that is really short in order to, to do things for a revenue for the future. No, they have to invest now and they want to see the, the revenue now and dialing with climate change, especially into resilience, we need to have a look to the midterm, for instance, or long-term perspective. So in our case, the language that we use to dial with the politician, with the practitioner, with the citizen, with the private investor was an issue that we try to solve and develop in a document that for those that knows what we are is the, the issue, they understand that there is a technical part in the behind, no, the behind the scene. But the politicians need to understand in a few words, the objective, the scope, what they could do, what they could also communicate to their surrounding, how can we say, no? Because uh, this is essential. And also there is a legacy from one political cycle mandate to another. You need to, to maintain the project because sometimes when the political uh, opposite you now becomes the majority, sometimes they erase completely what have been done before because they want to do something that is different. So no, no, no. That's why we put all the projects inside the municipality, not only the budget, but the, the, the municipality, public works and blah, 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 in order to give them continuity. So I think this could be, could be. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I think this relates pretty well to the, to the things that were mentioned in the first round table again. Huh? We, we need time, huh? we need to make a project and then wait for a few years and see what, what, what comes out of it. And then, of course, the, the issue of, of, of you know, the, the elective representatives and having been able to communicate to different um, uh, people with different timelines and different uh, cycles. Huh? This is, a, of course, a, a challenge. But um, maybe Anna has also experienced, experienced some of those. Um, what, what, is, what are your main lessons learned when it comes to, to, to these projects? I absolutely will agree with Stephanie. It's absolutely important to have politicians on the same board um, and uh, break it down in simple steps. Uh, what if? So what the stresses are so they understand if check happens, uh, what the consequences would be. So they start listening more. Um, but for uh, what we have done in Tbilisi's um, uh, situation, we did the preliminary resilience assessment before we released resilience strategy. Uh, we evaluated what our shocks and stresses were, what uh, was uh, who was the most vulnerable to the shocks and stresses. And before we released resilience strategy, we actually went and had meetings with 
pretty much every main uh, financial institution in the city. We wanted to make sure our projects were in line with their um, uh, objectives and missions and uh, main goals, because it's one thing to have a great strategy with the great plans, but it's on the other hand, you need financing for that. And if you're not aligned with international finance institutions, uh, you're not going to get any project funded. So it is absolutely important, both ways, communication with the financial institutions and also the politicians, elected uh, politicians. Um, so that's probably my one of my... <laughs> Yes, no, absolutely. It, it is indeed. I mean, the, the, I, I, I think the main uh, message, I think, from this roundtable for now is, is also you can have brilliant projects, but you need the financing. And so you need to, to find it and you need to communicate and you need to, you know, be innovative in order to in order to, to get that. Um, so it's, it, I think it's extremely, extremely interesting. Perhaps I know that there are some questions in the in the Q&A. Um, so Perhaps let's now um, turn into the, 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 you know, start the, the Q&A session. And I see there is a question uh, that is directed to uh, Joao. Um, indeed, um, you know, the, 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 the Climate Adaptation Fund that we talked about, I mean, I think it shows it is important to provide cities and regions with financing solutions. And it, it, since it influences their room of maneuver uh, in implementing their climate actions and I think on this topic, just very briefly, we have developed a, a, at the OECD a compendium of financial instruments that support climate action. And I suppose, and it basically makes uh, an inventory of all of these instruments. So maybe uh, the Climate Adaptation Fund is there as well. But the question is, uh, is to, to gather a bit more of information regarding this uh, fund in particular. So um, could you perhaps share with us a bit more what is the a total endowment of this of this fund or what are the sources of of financing uh, for for this fund in particular and perhaps if you have any examples of projects that have been financed uh, through through this um, fund thank you thank you a uh, good question and good challenge by the way uh, Mikael. so uh, i'll i'll take that challenge we'll be happy to share our experience uh, with you and uh, make sure that anyone can replicate this this is actually a good challenge because i'm a believer that any city small or big can do this and have the same impact that we have um so to reply to the question the goal of the fund is to support the civil community our partners uh that live in the same blue dot which is our planet to act uh, together with us to make sure that we save ourselves in this planet when it comes to climate change. Um, that's the main goal. So what we are doing is we are empowering these institutions uh, with financing, but also technical uh, support to make sure that their idea is implemented by them. And why is this? Like I said, climate change is a systemic uh, challenge. So that means it's about the water scarcity, uh, temperature rise, biodiversity loss, health issues, and you know we could stay here and name 100 impacts that we will face. I'm not an expert in 100. I'm not even an expert in one I consider myself. Um, so I need to ask people, like, you, you know so much about this subject and you know so much about your context, your territorial context. I need your help to uh, support our efforts on climate adaptation. That's basically my question to, to, these, to these institutions. And they reply, well, my idea is this. Then we say, okay, so here you go. Here's the fund to implement your idea, and we will help you with any burden that you might have or any challenge that you might find in terms of project management, because the idea is yours, and we are thankful for that. So what type of projects did we do, just to give you a good example of what we're talking about? So for example, maximum uh, uh, amount of money that we give to each NGO is 3,000 euros. It could be 10,000 euros, it could be 50,000 euros, but we wanted to prove that the, the, the project scope works. So the smaller the, the amount, the easier it is to test out. Turns out it was more or less the, the ideal approach because if it's too big, only big NGOs have the capacity to do that. If it's too small, they're not experienced enough and they know, don't know how to manage the money or make acquisitions or manage projects. So 3,000 euros fits somewhere in between and everyone can apply with it. That's very important because then it's an inclusive project. So what did we have? Okay, 
For example, we had uh, a scouts a scouts group that uh, promoted to put drinking fountains uh, near key areas uh, near public transportation, which is a good idea. We never thought of that. People keep commuting every day. That's a good idea. So bam, here's the money, help us to implement these, um, these equipment. Uh, then we have another one, for example, that they wanted to qualify a riverbed, naturalization of a riverbed. So basically nature-based solutions. Um, and uh, because it was a bit abandoned, uh, it was public space and they, they knew that. So they wanted to make sure that the people that lived in that area w could use that, um, that riverbed again. So they cleaned the riverbed, they planted trees, they taught about biodiversity on every other weekend for a summer, for a full summer. They informed people of why, for example, they came um, uh, and some trees are invasive and others are native. What's the difference between them? We have another one very interesting that engaged with the fishing community and the fishing community would grab all the waste that they would find in their in their activities they would put in a special bin and then the waste that was uh, collected it would be transformed into picnic tables or urban furniture for our green parks yeah. uh, we had another one uh, for example uh, that designed a website to inform people about what type of activities could they do individually um, like an agenda to make them more resilient as a family. Um, oh, let me see what else. We have there's plenty a, of them. A, yeah, I, I can see. Yeah, I can see. I can see. There's there's a lot to 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 to, to gather here. No, no. I mean, uh, ideas as you were mentioning before, ideas that one person cannot possibly come up oneself, right? So it's it's yeah. extremely extremely interesting i think uh you of course you, you answered the question uh you know squarely so thank you so much yeah, i just wanted to yeah. give you one last example yes <laughs> please quick. give very quick just but make, very on. briefly because yes. they deserve this for example a school a kindergarten school because i've heard it so much uh they were starting to teach kids about addition right one plus one and so they uh, applied for the funding to get faucets and equipment to save water and they counted the amount of buckets that they were saving. So four or five-year-old kids learned about saving water with this fund. That was amazing yeah. too. Just another yeah. example. That's, that's beautiful. I mean, I th and as you were mentioning that we, we've been talking about kindergartens, and I, I would there's a question also for for Anna uh, about about these uh, kindergartens because true true you you did mention that there were some some. Um, Issues you were mentioning that investors didn't find it a, prof a profitable investment, right? Um, but you still managed to build 33, you mentioned, right? So, how did you go about that? What, where, where did that financing come from? Was it some investors that were keen enough to, to invest, or how did you manage that? Um, yes, uh, it's still a challenge. Uh, unfortunately, it's all city budget funding um, because, as I said, it is very challenging. It's not profitable to invest in kindergartens. Investors always ask uh, projects like uh, hospitals um, so they get more profit. Um, but this is um, very low income, uh, very uh, low profit from the kindergartens. So pretty much this is one of the main challenges for the city. We have built uh, 33 kindergartens, but it didn't happen within a year. Uh, it has happened uh, since uh, like eight years. So it took us eight years to build 33 kindergartens. We're opening three new ones. And unfortunately, other 154 kindergartens, they do need reevaluation. They do need to make sure they're structurally safe uh, and uh, uh, renovate them. We also work in on European standards, make sure they all the safeties are up to standards. Um, so this is one of the things new kindergartens have to go through as well. Uh, but because it is costly and um, fortunately, um, SID doesn't have so much budget to allocate to the kindergarten, we still allocate that much that physically you cannot put more city budget into the kindergarten. So that's why it takes time. And we do three, four kindergartens per year, not more. Um, right, yeah, an, an, an incremental approach. Yeah, no, I can, I can, I can see that. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that question is now uh, clear. And there's one last question uh, very quickly for Stefania. 
Um, I mean, in, in fact, one of the recommendations that we have in our project at the OECD, which has been mentioned before, I mean, the, the World Observatory for some National Government Finance and Investment, uh, is to diversify the sources of financing, but also to collaborate effectively across levels of government, right? And, and, and so how are the national and perhaps also regional governments supporting you, the city of Genoa, uh, finance these initiatives? Do you have any examples of initiatives where you have been cooperating? Is it always the case? Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about that? And if, if you can be brief, I would very much appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yes, we, we collaborate at, at well, of regional level and especially national level and then European level. European. Mm -hmm. But European level, okay. And private and you know. Uh, with the at national level, uh, we collaborate uh, with the more or less three or four different ministries. And uh, even we collaborate in implementing adaptation, exactly adaptation solution and adaptation project. For instance, under the, the, the bridge that collapsed in 2018, we have a master plan that was the master plan that was included in the technical brief. And uh, uh, in this uh, super regenerating project, also including adaptation measure, gray, green, and soft, and, and the majority are green but also soft exactly to announce the resilience of the communities and the diverse community. We collaborate at national level to do this. And in that case, at district level, we have a complementary uh, funds that are national funds for the recovery part after the, the disaster. Uh, national funds instead dedicated completely to adaptation. So a sort of adaptation funds at national level and we use it. And, uh, and then there are some diverse investor that are private investor for the other parts and then the municipality budget. So in the same area, we combine different funds in matching the same goal. This mm -hmm. is, for instance, one example. Another one could be uh, the, um, the, water, the waterfront of our cities, the eastern part of this waterfront that benefit of a plenty of diverse investment uh, facility for the same project in matching exactly the same goal. That is creating a new blue infrastructure for the people and the new uh, spaces for, uh, uh, for, uh, for a tissue that need to have new space, especially after the COVID, the people, uh, when they have the possibility, went whenever they can, because they need space. And mm -hmm. so, on, on uh, so on this way, we start elaborating new projects for giving new space of high quality of life standard. No, with new green space, new ecosystem services, and special new space for new social models of collaboration and new also crowdfunding scheme to realize this super big project. And then we have instead a small project realized more or less with the mechanism similar to that that Joao explained, uh, where there is a participatory process and also participatory budget, but not completely only of uh, belonging to the municipality. It is a sort of crowdfunding, municipality budget, private investor, exactly in the same, well, small areas, small project, mm -hmm. but incredible yeah. powerful for the people because the people need to trust. and need yeah. to, Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. This is extremely interesting. I mean, you, you mentioned crowdfunding, for example, I think we could do a, a, a whole pa a panel of that. So so thank you very much. I, I heard similar issues, similar projects, similar opportunities. Um, I think we can learn a lot from, from each other. So, so thank you so much. I think we could keep answering questions which keep coming in, uh, but uh, unfortunately we have run out of time and I believe it is now time to close this second round table. A huge thank you to all of the three panelists, uh, Anna, Joao, Stefania, for making time to share their experiences. I am sure that these have been extremely useful for all people listening to us. And uh, we have seen that resilience is extremely important in this uncertain world. And we have also seen that resilience is boosted through policy initiatives that need to be properly financed, uh, but that financing these are is not always straightforward, especially for subnational governments. And in fact, funding and financing themselves need to be resilient. 
But for the last few minutes, and very quickly, I'm pleased to present the World Observatory on Subnational Government Finance and Investment. This is an initiative that has been developed by the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities, and uh, United Cities and Local Governments, also in partnership with, the, uh, with CEB, but also UNCBF, ADB, AFD, among, among others. And I think that this can be an interesting resource for regional and local governments working in this field, in the field of uh, resilience. So the World Observatory is the world's largest source of internationally comparable data and analysis on multi-level governance and some national finance. It has so far three editions, the last of which came, uh, uh, came in uh, last year in 2022. And this is a global initiative. It, it encompasses 135 countries, meaning that it covers 93 of the world's uh, population, and it provides analytical insights across and within world regions, so Europe, Middle East, Asia, Africa, etc. But how can it be, how can the World Observatory be useful to you? Well, I mean, think of it as an initiative with three main pillars. First, there is a database that has a visualization tool and you can select an indicator, so expenditure, investment, tax revenue, and you can compare it across 135 countries. Second, there are country profiles, which basically provide you with detailed information on each country's multi-level governance framework, public finance, and some other thematic issues, such as, for example, the uh, management of the COVID crisis. And finally, for each edition, we publish a synthesis report, which is a report that has the key findings uh, to, um, to identify common trends and challenges. And it is a report that makes sense of all of this data. And uh, there are several sections where we refer and delve into the issues of resilience and resilient finances. And so, as I was mentioning before, one of the recommendations we make is that the resilience of multi-level governance and finance frameworks should be promoted by taking several actions, such as balancing the responsibilities and the resources that cities and regions have, creating flexible and efficient horizontal and vertical equalization mechanisms, facilitate uh, access to external financing. We, we heard about investors, right? So uh, facilitate access to an external financing for subnational uh, governments and diversifying funding uh, systems based on a basket of revenues, such as grants, taxes, tariffs, fees, and property income, for example. So I think it falls squarely within what we've been discussing today, and I think it is worth having a look if you are interested in these topics. So as I said, this is a joint effort indeed, the, and the interest in finances and how to make them more resilient has been growing over time, and so have our, our partners. This project as well benefits from the guidance of a steering committee. So I invite you to have a look at the website that you see on screen, check your country, your neighbors perhaps, and compare and learn using the World Observatory for which I hope we will be providing an update in 2025. That is all from me. Uh, thank you so very much again to everybody, the panelists, Elisa, Noah, uh, Sophia, and everybody else at uh, CEB, and of course also ICLEI. Many thanks, and over to you, Elisa. Thank you, Michael, and all the speakers for a, a thought-provoking and very open discussion. And it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Noah, who is going to give the closing remarks for the webinar. So, Noah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Elisa, and thanks also for all the panelists and 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 the, the great discussion that we had today. So uh, speaking about, let's say, the key messages that we had in our discussion, it was definitely a very, very rich and, and very insightful discussion, and it was a challenge, actually, to try to put some some uh, key, uh, let's say, put, put the summary into very few sentences. But I would say starting with the a very strong message that Thomas brought in about how uh, looking into the global challenges and how cities are facing these challenges and the importance of building resilience at all levels. So whether we are speaking about participatory planning or uh, we're speaking about financing and investments, uh, bringing the resilience into action is actually the key, let's say, step forward and, and way moving forward. Uh, Elisa have uh, also shared with us the, the, the introductory uh, presentation with the seven key actions and how the 
interactions between the seven uh, principles that has been uh, outlined in the uh, CAB report. From that, we started to, to have very interesting insights from, from and the, the, the key lessons that has been learned in terms of innovative approaches through the vulnerability lens and most importantly, understanding that no one size fits all. So uh, with the first uh, round table discussion around participatory planning at the city of Barcelona, we've heard a lot about the super blocks program and how providing a systematic transformation for every street to become green street have actually actually help to reduce uh, issues around traffic by 20%, enhance social activities and engagement of the communities through participatory budgeting, which also is a very interesting element that also have, we've heard about in the second roundtable discussion. Uh, from uh, Also from Copio, we uh, being also a, a very active uh, city member for ECLE and participant in the 100 Renewable Cities and Regions Energy Compact, culture and health well-being also was a very important element that brought citizens together in participatory planning. The What's You project from Rotterdam, uh, again, a very uh, interesting lessons around how communities and community leaders can be in empowered to be leaders of projects and decide on how investments could take place and not forgetting also the very interesting experiences from Dublin around food culture and do we need actually a farmer to grow apples to keep the doctor away. Uh, from the second round table discussions emphasis a lot our, around integrating resilience into investment plans and inclusive governance. How do we actually define resilience in order for us to allocate investments to it from the city of Tbilisi came in strongly and as well as uh, Cascais and, and also sharing their experience when it comes into the ADAPT uh, Cascais Fund. And last but not least, we've also heard from Genoa around their resilience strategies and the importance to bring politicians on board. Uh, with that, language comes in very strongly as a keyword and time as well as uh, to enhance ownership and building resilience for communities. Uh, with that, I am honoured to, to close uh, our webinar for today and thank uh, everyone who we have on board here. Also thank the great uh, work from the OECD as well as uh, from uh, Elisa and, uh, and the Council of Europe Development Bank and also extending our thanks from ICLE and inviting you to join us for the European Urban Resilience Forum that is planned to take place this year in October in Kashkais on the 18th and the 20th of October to address all of these interesting elements that we spoke about today and speak about our plan moving forward. So thank you all.